This is Derek Johnson. He's the executive director of Global Zero. GlobalZero.org is the website. You can tweet him at Derek J G Z or at Global Zero. Derek, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Um, tell me what, first of all, what is, what was the INF Treaty? Where did this come from? Why should we be concerned about this? And why is Donald Trump getting us out of this treaty? Oh, goodness. That's a great, great place to start. So the INF Treaty um, has been around for about 30 years. This was a, a Reagan-Gorbachev agreement. It was the, it was the first of its kind. Uh, eliminated an entire category of nuclear weapons. These were uh, short-range uh, and medium-range nuclear missiles um, that had basically, you know, terrorized Europe uh, for most of the Cold War. Um, Reagan and Gorbachev sat down, uh, agreed to get rid of these things, sent thousands of nuclear missiles to the scrap heap, um, and and helped bring about the the end of the Cold War. Uh, this treaty. Mm -hmm. um, as for for why the Trump administration is uh, is shredding it, um, <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Um, well, hang on, just a second. The, the excuse that they gave was that Russia is not in compliance. And my understanding is that the non-compliance that Russia had been involved with uh, didn't have to do with building nuclear weapons, you know, battlefield nukes and smaller intermediate range nukes, which is what this treaty bans, but instead had to do with, uh, I believe, a radar system that was too closely positioned to to uh, one of the NATO countries, uh, in Poland or something. What was was the was the breach? And apparently, you know, they're claiming that we're also in breach. Was the breach so severe as to justify doing away with the treaty? Because now my understanding is that uh, is that the uh, you know Putin is saying, um, cool, you know, without this treaty, we're actually we've got this hypersonic travels five feet speed times faster than than a sound a missile that we can launch from a plane that's going to come out. It's a kind of a glider that's undetectable by radar, and we're, and we're also building uh, smaller weapons that we're going to use in a European theater, possibly. You know, correct me, what, what do I have wrong about that, first of all? Yeah, so, okay, so there's been a, there's been a dispute around this treaty for a number of years. So on, we've got mutual allegations of, of cheating on both sides. You have the Americans are saying that Russia has developed a missile, um, that is, uh, flies within that prohibited range, um, and that this, this, uh, that the Russians have deployed this in violation of the treaty. On the flip side, you have the Russians, of course, who deny that um, and say, well, you know, the Americans have deployed missile defense systems that can very easily and quickly be sort of retooled to fire prohibited missiles. Hmm. So the Americans are upset with the Russians, the Russians are upset with the Americans, and this has been um, a bit of an impasse for even going back to the Obama administration. But what's, um, I think, remarkably uh, alarming here is that the, the Trump administration's answer to that problem is to just sh shred the treaty uh, and remove all restraints on all nuclear weapon weapons, which to me makes no sense. If, if, if the United States doesn't want Russia to build INF-prohibited weapons, then why on earth would we get rid of the treaty that's keeping them from doing that? Because as you, as you said, the immediate response to this is, Russia's or the United States is ending the treaty. We're going to start building INF prohibited systems. And Russia says, oh, great, you're, you're going to do that. We're going to do the same thing. Now it's off to a new nuclear arms race. Right. And this is and, and, and my understanding, we're talking with Derek Johnson of Global Zero. My understanding is that the new this new generation of, of what are sometimes referred to as battlefield nukes, um, you know, low yield nuclear weapons that could be deployed in a, a World War Two kind of scenario. Um, you know, an intra-Europe uh, World War II kind of scenario, are, you know, we say that they're very small because they're on the kiloton <laughs> range rather than the megaton range, but that was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Weren't those, you know, less than a megaton nuclear devices? Yeah, exactly. Look, there's, there's no such thing as a small nuclear weapon. I mean, we, the, the low-yield label is a bit of a misnomer. Um, you know, a nuke is a nuke is a nuke. The, uh, the bombs that annihilated Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, by today's standards, small nuclear weapons. Um, and the weapons that we, the, the, real, the real danger about uh, smaller nuclear weapons is that um, they're more tempting to use in a crisis. Um, these, these sort of armchair strategists and military planners think that um, you can use one of these things and have a lower risk of, sort of escalation to all nuclear war. But I think that just ignores the, you know, ignores realities on the ground. You know, the second that you um, introduce uh, a nuclear weapon to a conflict, that is that is a that is a global event. Um, 
that's that's strategic. That's going to change the game, and all all bets are are off. And which which is the number one reason to not abandon the INF, um, this treaty. But the, the treaty is dead now. So what do we do next? We you know let's let's say you know in a year and a half, two years. Uh, two, well, it'll be a little more than it'll be two years from now actually. Um, Three weeks short of two years. We've got a new president, right? Well, who's counting? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we've got a new president, and the challenge is before us. You know, we really don't want an international arms race. And, and, and there is one point that I think the opponents of this treaty have made that that is something that we really need to seriously consider, and that is that, um, you know, Russia is a relatively small country. They've got an economy the size of Texas. Um, they could build nuclear weapons, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, on a global level, outside of the possibility of nuclear war, they are not our biggest uh, threat. The, China has now, you know, the Chinese economy in the last few months has actually surpassed the American economy in terms of consumer purchasing. In any case, at, at any rate, and um, and China is building out their military in ways that are just absolutely rapid and breathtaking. A lot of their infrastructure has to do with military support. It's, it's difficult to distinguish their military from their civilian stuff. There's concern that their, their military is involved with some of these companies that are making uh, equipment used in the U.S. for telecommunications and even, you know, for defense. I mean, we can't build uh, cruise missiles without Chinese chips now. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so shouldn't we, uh, you know, and, and China was never part of the, uh, of the INF, of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. So shouldn't we be trying to create a worldwide version of this rather than just a U.S.-Russia version? Well, so a couple things. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it's a little premature to say the INF Treaty is, is dead. We actually, what, what happened on Saturday was the U.S. announced its intent to withdraw, and that sets uh, that basically sets off a six-month timer um, because it's a, it's a six-month process to, to pull your country out of the treaty. So there okay. actually is still time uh, for the U.S. to um, get its act together <laughs> and, get, uh, and get back into the negotiating room, which I'm, I hope they do. And they've, they've, made, they've made some indications that they're, they would be open to talks. Mm -hmm. Um, short of that, yeah, I think, um, you know, if, they, if, if come August, um, no sort of uh, the U.S. and Russia don't seize on, on some sort of acceptable resolution to this dispute, then INF goes away. Um, and you have, a, you have a, an opening for the U.S. and Russia to really go gangbusters um, on a whole new category of uh, weapon systems. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a big problem. Um, I think there are, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to happen. Um, these are these are not weapon systems that uh, that the U.S. wants, um, or that the U.S. needs. There's no there's no big constituency pushing for this, mm -hmm. um, and you know these things take time and um, require quite a bit of funds. Um, there's already been a bill introduced in Congress um, by uh, Senator Merkley and others uh, that would, uh, would would not allow funding to go to you know R and D and development of these. Of, the, of these weapons, so it's not you know it's not. You're going to have a hard time with that though if the Russians are building them. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Um, that's a fair point. Um, as to your your second point about China, yes, absolutely. Arms control across the board needs to be multilateralized. You know, you know there's nine uh, nine nations on on Earth that have nuclear weapons. Only two are engaged uh, uh, over the last 30 years have engaged in arms control discussions. So yes, it is time to it is time to bring China uh, into the conversation. It's time to bring India. It's time to bring Pakistan and others. Right. Um, but I don't think that um, uh, if you're concerned about uh, Chinese military buildup, the answer is not to uh, sh shred an agreement between the U.S. and Russia uh, that keeps them from uh, embarking on an arms race of their own. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, amazing stuff. Derek Johnson, he is the uh, executive director of Global Zero. Uh, and GlobalZero.org is the website. Uh, Derek JZ, GZ or Global Zero uh, are the Twitter handles. Derek, thanks for dropping by. Thanks so much. Great talking with you and fascinating conversation. We'll be right back.